a new song to you and you know sometimes we can get weary and we can get wrapped up in everything that's going on in our life you know whether it's a finances or sickness or political turmoil or whatever it is and we need to be reminded right of God's faithfulness of God's goodness how good God is so I'm going to teach you this chorus real quick and then we'll get into it well, I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life, all over my life. I see your promises in fulfillment all over my life, all over my life. Isn't that good? Let's sing it again. I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life. All over my life, all your promises. I see 
your promises in fulfillment all over my life all over my life here we go but all throughout my history Your faithfulness is walked beside me. The winter storms bring way for spring. In every season, from where I'm standing, yeah.
You are glorious, Jesus. We worship you, dear Heavenly Father. God, you are sovereign. Lord God, I pray, Jesus, that we would empty our hearts so that, that you may pour into us what, what you want to, dear Heavenly Father, God. That we would let your will be done, Lord Jesus. That we would surrender to you today. Lord God, I thank you, Jesus, for letting us get together and worship you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus, and we praise you. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Renaissance, we are so excited to have you here with us today. You might be joining us on Ren Live, or you're here with us in person. Whatever the case, welcome. If this is your first time, we want to get to know you. If you're watching online, take a moment to go to rendicator.org. Click on the Church at Home link, and then look for the button that says, Tell Us About You. If you're in person, don't be shy. After this gathering, come meet us out in the gallery. Some of our staff members will be out there at the welcome station to say hey and give you a gift. Thanks for joining us today. While we are meeting up here on the third floor, our Ren Kids classes are in full swing down on the first and second floors. At our 9 a.m. gathering, we have classes available for kids ages nursery through fifth grade. Speaking of fifth grade, third, fourth, and fifth graders, if you are in the room, this is your time to go to your class on the second floor. You can get up now and walk out towards the back doors. Your leaders are there waiting for you. Thanks for worshiping with us. Parents, at the 11 a.m. gathering, we have classes available for ages nursery through toddler only. If you call Renaissance your church home, we want to invite you to get involved in a ministry team. There are so many great things that happen when we serve together. We meet new people, we make great connections, and forever friends. We also get to practice being more like Jesus when we serve others. Whether you are welcoming someone new, looking through a camera, or loving on kids, Wherever you serve, you get the chance to be a picture of how much Jesus cares for them. So to join a ministry team, come to the welcome station today to talk with the team leader. We will have you fill out a card to get you started. We want to take a moment to thank everyone who partners with us and gives at Renaissance. Your faithful giving enables us to do what we can while trusting God to do what only He can do. If you'd like to start giving with us today, you can do that in person by using the giving boxes or kiosk located around the building or online at rendicator.org give. You can also use our text to give option. Just text an amount to 217-882-6111 to get started. One last thing. 2020 giving statements are prepared and ready for you. There's a table set up in the gallery and you can pick them up there. That's what's happening at REN today. Be sure to follow us on social media for content and check-ins throughout the week. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks for being here today. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> yes, it's so great to be with all of you. My name is Jeff, and I am the lead pastor here at the church. And um, I instructed the, the tech team back there to also throw up my email address. If you guys have ever wondered um, how to get a hold of me best, it's sometimes just easy to send me uh, an email. Um, so feel free to pull your phone out, take a note of that, take a picture of that. So um, sometimes you might have a question or want to add to something that I said or maybe disagree with something I said. I welcome those emails. I will say this. I don't always respond to them, right, um, in a timely fashion. Uh, so just be warned of that. But um, I'm available to you, so I'd love for you guys to reach out to me at any time. Um, when I was younger, I remember hearing this idiom. I think idiom is the right word. Uh, send me an email if I'm wrong. <laughs> uh, the early bird catches the worm or the early bird gets the worms. Anybody remember that? Um, and as a child, I really had no idea why people said that. I had no idea why, who, who cares if you catch a worm or not? I, I'm not a bird. I don't have any desire to catch worms and, and that type of thing. But as I became an adult, like uh, some of you, some of you have become adults, you've probably grasped, grasped that idea a little bit differently. Now we understand that if there's, in fact, something that a person wants, maybe, that that it's best to discipline ourselves to rise early, right, and to go get that. Why? Because other birds want to get the same thing you want, and it's best that you go get it first. 
right? Is this making sense to some of us? Yeah, so I remember hearing that as a child and thinking that was a bit strange. And that, that idiom, or maybe a proverb is a better word to explain that, um, was first found or was first cited in the 17th century. It's an old English idiom or proverb um, was when we first see that. I bring that up because I want you to know that those statements oftentimes have a lot of truth to them, but not always are they filled with truth. But there is actually some Proverbs um, that are filled with truth, and they're in our Bible. It's in the Old Testament book, our Old Testament, yeah, book of Proverbs. We might call this the Hebrew portion of the Bible. But inside of this a book called Proverbs, there's all kinds of those pithy little sayings that are good for us to be mindful of, to think of. These are things not just that we think are good ideas, but are in fact God's great ideas for us, that he has um, instructed Solomon and the other writers of the Proverbs to write these things down. And should we sort of take them into our lives, they could um, help us to live our lives a little differently. So I I picked one out that I want to lead with today. And it's in Proverbs 18, verse 21. And I'm just going to read the first little part of this proverb. And it says this, that death and life are in the power of the tongue. Now think about that for a moment. Think about that um, from the vantage point of a small child, maybe. Maybe like when you were younger and didn't understand the early bird gets the worm type proverb. What is the what does it mean to say that, that death and life are in the power of the tongue? What does it mean? How, how would a child see that? How, how should we understand it? What do you mean the tongue can actually kill somebody? I've never actually seen that horror movie, and I've seen a lot of them, right? I've never seen that done. I've read, never read that in the newspapers, that a tongue has actually killed somebody. But as an adult, and I think through even experience um, of life, I now know what that means a little bit better. I want to share a story with you, and by no means this is um, meant to make you feel sorry for me, although that might help in the story. I'll just throw that out there. Um, But there was a moment, I was uh, about 12 years ago, I was in my late 30s. So if you're doing the math, I'm in my 50s now. So I'm in my late 30s, and I'm I'm in a worship band. uh, Before, If you don't know this, before I became a pastor, I was actually a worship leader. I, I did that in a church. And so I was in a worship band, and one night... I was rehearsing with the worship band, and um, everyone in the band was younger than me, right? And I was already starting to deal with these feelings of inadequacy and insecurities and feeling like I'm just too old to be doing what I'm doing with all of these young guys. You know what I mean? You ever know sports, like athletes who you say, man, they should have retired five years ago, but they're still playing? Like, I never wanted to be that guy who stuck around too long. So I'm already dealing with some of that in my own. And at some point during one of those rehearsals one evening when things were going late into the night, um, and I might have said something like, man, I wish I could just go home and go to bed, right, because I'm an old guy now. Somebody on the band said these words to me. Jeff, how does it feel to be, to be the oldest person on the stage right now? And I thought to myself and before Jesus as my witness, <laughs> I wanted to kill that person, <laughs> right? I'm like, how, how, like, like, no, I'm, I'm joking. At first I was like, well, that, whatever, yeah, I'm an old guy. It doesn't matter. But fast forward 12 years, and two weeks ago my wife says, hey, Jeff, if ever you're not preaching on a Sunday, would you ever want to play guitar in the band again? And you know what my first response to her was? No. No. I don't want to. And why is that? Because I think 12 years ago, those words actually said something to me that I didn't fully understand. I'm not doing this to go through a therapy session, right? That's not what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to, to really emphasize that point, that the things that we say actually do have the ability to bring life and or death. Uh, simply put, words matter. They carry a lot of weight for us. Now, I'm working through some of that, and by God's good grace, I'm actually playing guitar again. Yay, not that you care, but I'm super excited because here's what I know about myself. God, God created me with the love for music. I love music. In fact, a piece of my life has been missing since I haven't been playing guitar. So I'm so thankful that I am playing guitar again. And if you're lucky, one day I might very well play guitar up here as well, right? Yay, yeah. <laughs> Shut up. No, no, no. I'm just saying that story to, to point to that reality. It was a, a long time later that I realized that the words that someone said, just in jest, and I didn't hold anything against that person, and that person is still a friend of mine. This is not that, right? That's not the issue. But that those words actually um, did something. The Apostle James, um, if you go now to our New Testament, James, his book, is actually considered 
by many people to be the, the Proverbs, if you will, of the New Testament. So here's some, some other pithy God-driven statements that are helpful for us as well. And, and James seems to pick up on, on that same type of language when in chapter 3, verse 10, he says this. And this is the first part of this verse here. It says, from the same mouth come blessing and cursing. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. And in that chapter, chapter 3 of James, James also says in, in verse 1 of that, he leads with this. And I want to read this to you. Not many of you, he says, should become teachers, my brothers and sisters. For you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. Okay. I'm trying to set up something so I can pivot into something else. So just bear with me for a few more moments. What James is alluding to here is that tongues matter. They can bring life and death. The words we say can bless and curse. And in the context of that chapter, he's actually talking to some of the, the people, the followers of God, Jesus followers, who, who he finds it somewhat hypocritical that sometimes they'll use their mouths to praise him. God, you're great. God, you're wonderful. Doing things like we just did a few moments ago. And yet on Monday or Tuesday, they're using that same mouth to sing, to say negative things about other people, to curse other people, to be frustrated towards other people and to say things. And he says, it's just silly that we would use our mouth to praise him on one day and say something negative the next day. And in the context of that, he says, so you, you have to know this, that those of us who actually use our words to proclaim the truth about Jesus and the, and the truth of God's kingdom and what he's trying to do, that the people who speak those things actually will be, will be judged more strictly. And by judge, it means this, that we have to answer for the words that we say. A Christian leader and writer, author, Kerry Newhoff, said this, that leaders' words weigh like 800 pounds. That every word carries with it a certain amount of weight. And some of you right now are going, Whew, I'm glad I'm not a pastor. I'm glad I'm not a teacher. I'm glad hasn't, God hasn't given me that call. But before you're too quick to say that, may I remind you that many of you are, in fact, in positions of leadership where you proclaim the truth of who Jesus is and what God's doing in his kingdom, maybe not from a pulpit or a platform in a church, but some of you are husbands and you have wives and children. And like it or not, <laughs> That's a position of authority and teaching. And like it or not, you're actually saying things. And your words, like it or not, carry a certain amount of weight. Some of you are leaders at the workplace. Some of you are leaders just in social groups. Some of you are leaders just with your friends. You're a self-appointed leader. All your friends are like, who, thought, who made him the boss? But you're the boss nonetheless, right? And so our words carry weight. And you have to know this, when it comes to the things of God, that the words that we say will cause us to be judged more strictly. Now, I don't know what that means totally, but I need you to know this. These, this verse has, um, I'm looking for the right word. I don't want to speak hyperbolic here, but I want to be sincere. This verse has terrified me this week. It's terrified me this week. I have to come up here and I have to stand here and I have to say some things to you. And, and oh, uh, this week, most weeks, I'm usually terrified, <laughs> right? In fear and trembling, do I come before you and say some of the things that I'm about to say? And, uh, this week is no exception. I feel the weight of the words that I'm about to say. So I want to pray. If you could just bow your heads with me for a moment, not to be too heavy here, but I just want to pray that God would, would help me. Would you pray for me? And that God would help us just in general, because there's, there's a truth to be had um, in our world, and I want to grab hold of it. So let's pray together. Lord, I thank you for our time together. Thank you for the scriptures, the proverbs about life and death being in the tongue, about the mouth being able to curse and to bless. And so, Lord, I pray that uh, the words that I speak would be driven by you, not by my own ambition or my own desires, but they would be your words, and that these people, your people, would hear them the way you intend them, that, that you would open their ears and their eyes and they could actually hear and see what you want them to hear and see. We thank you that we can come together, Lord, and we ask that you help us today and do what only you can do, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen? I find it fascinating that James is actually the author of those words. 
that he would actually talk about preaching and teaching and how that's a critical thing and that you're going to be judged more strictly because of it. Because if you know the backstory of James, it will shock you. Hear me. It will shock you. You will actually begin to believe that God is alive, <laughs> that God does things, and he works miracles in people's lives. And how do I know that? Because I know who James used to be. At least we believe we know who James used to be. The author of James, most people believe, is actually the brother of Jesus, or we would say half-brother. Mary and Joseph did end up getting married after the virgin birth and conception and birth and all that miraculous stuff. Merry Christmas, right? They did get married, and they went ahead and had more children. James is one of his half-siblings, so to speak. The shocking thing about James, like you, many of you, and myself included, James was an unbeliever. Isn't that weird? James didn't believe that his brother, Jesus, was the chosen one, the anointed one, the Messiah, the one God was going to use to reestablish his kingdom on the earth. He did not believe those things. And in fact, at one point, the Gospel of Mark tells us that his family thought Jesus was crazy. Look at this verse in Matthew, or Mark chapter 3, verse 21. When his family heard it, the things that Jesus was doing, Mark chapter 3, verse 21, they went out to seize him, Jesus, for they were saying he is out of his mind. Now, in the context of what Mark is writing about here, Jesus had just been performing miracles, right? He got baptized. Now he's doing miracles. He's doing things. He's gathering disciples, calling them apostles, and he's sending them out with authority to cast out devils, to heal people, to proclaim the kingdom of God, all of these things. And Jesus takes a break from that, goes home to rest and the people gather around the house. So, so many people come, it says that he couldn't even take a break to eat because he's continuing to teach and to preach. And in the middle of all of that, his family run out of the house and they seize Jesus, telling him almost to be quiet. They think he's crazy. The things he's saying can't possibly be true. It's my thought, right? Email me if you think differently. <laughs> that James might have been there as well. That he also didn't believe in Jesus as Messiah. But something changed. What was it? History tells us that when Jesus was resurrected from the dead and walked around and met with people, that James saw his brother who was laid dead in a tomb up and walking again. And in that moment, he believed. And, and many of you are like, well, I would believe too if a dead guy would come back to life. But hear me, that's the story we believe in, Right? That God did send Jesus. He is the chosen one, the anointed one, to reconcile all of sinners, right, against God, back into God's good graces through his sacrifice on a cross. Everyone believes this, right? Well, not everyone, but that's what we believe, right? Yes, that's, the answer is yes. But it didn't just stop there. I need you to hear this. Jesus dying on a cross was not just to establish for us salvation, which he's done. Would you agree? We can't have salvation without Jesus' death on a cross and his resurrection. Yes, the answer is yes to that. But there's more to the story. In fact, for us to fully get it, we have to look at the entirety of Scripture and see the story as it lays out. God had lost, if you will, humanity. He's lost the world when sin entered into the world. And in Genesis chapter 3, he promises to restore that at some point. He says, I'm going to send someone to fix it. And the, the one he sends is Jesus, right? Yay. The answer is Jesus to these questions. But the story is more than just to bring salvation to us, but it's to restore the world, to establish his kingdom. If we minimize what Jesus did on the cross and his resurrection for just our own salvation, we become what... Uh, Oh, shoot, I, I was reading a book the other day. I forget. What's his name? Doesn't matter. This really smart guy said, I know the name. Email me, I'll tell you. Uh, he, he says, we become soterians, which just means this. The doctrine of salvation is soteriology. If we just minimize the cross and what Jesus has done just for salvation, we miss so much else of what God is doing. If you just nod at me and move on, I'll move on. Yes. You, okay, yes. I need you to hear this. That's the truth. It's more than just our salvation. But why do we have the proclivity to just make it about our salvation? You ready for this? It's because we're narcissists. Because we have so much self-import about us and our lives, we think it's always and forever about us. And we miss the fact that God is doing something greater. A good friend of mine um, had a... My brain has shut off, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Just shout out the words. If the thing you put your cups on, 
Coasters. Would you guys not yell at me, please? <laughs> yes, she had a coaster um, on her desk. Uh, she worked at a church. We don't hold that against her. I work at a church. But she had a coaster, and it said these words, um, Jesus loves you, but I'm his favorite. Oh. Now, some of you are like, heck, yeah. I could get behind something. That's a great proverb right there. I could get behind that. You know, I've, I've repeated these words. It's not original to me. I've heard this before. But someone has once said, and I've said these things, you know, self-disclosure. Um, if I was the only person to have ever lived on the earth, I believe Jesus would still come and die on a cross for me. You believe this? I think it's true. I totally think it's true. The issue I take with some of those statements is that it's so about us. And so much about us. And, and what happens is when we make it about us, it is so easy to then just make it about our tribe or our group. I'm going to do something right now, and this is going to just kick us in the shins. So just, just bear with me. Jesus loves you, but I'm his favorite. Jesus loves Pakistan, but America is his favorite. Do you feel the ground shake right there? Do you feel it? See, it's so easy for us to exalt not just ourselves, but now our tribe and even our nation as somehow it's special. I think America's special, <laughs> right? But unique and specific that God, somehow America only is the thing that God cares about. And would you all just agree with me that that's not true? Please agree with me. <sighs> Please agree with me. Yes, he cares deeply for Pakistan. Pakistan is 96% Muslim. 96. Of the 4% remaining, two of those are Hindi or Hindu, and about 2% of that is Christian. And God loves them. He loves them dearly. It's so easy for us to make it about all of us and what God is doing through us because we're always have the proclivity to be narcissist. So we make the story of salvation a story about us and about our country. And may I remind you of the words of John the Revelator in Revelation chapter 7. You're like, ooh, Jeff's going to preach out of Revelation now. Let's go. Or what some of you all say, Revelations. You add an S to it like you add an S to Walmarts. There's no S in there. I don't, whatever. But there's no S. Look it up. Get a Bible, look it up. But uh, John, John the Revelator says this, and again, he's been given a vision. We don't know what this looks like exactly. Um, email me if you know. Um, and he, he says, I see a vision of heaven. I see God on the throne and the lamb, which seems so unusual if you don't know the context of the story. The lamb, hear me, is who? Oh, my gosh, you guys are terrible. Yes, the, the lamb is Jesus. Hear me, I, the answer is always Jesus. <laughs> If I ever ask you a question, the answer is Jesus, okay? The lamb in this vision that he's seeing of heaven and the future events, whatever this is, Jesus. So he sees God on the throne and Jesus there. And in Revelation chapter 7, verse 9 and 10, it says this. After this, I looked and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from where every nation, from all of the tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the lamb. They're clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, whatever that is, right? We can talk about that later. And crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. The point in reading those two verses is that it is all the nations, that it is all the people groups. Josh reminded me this morning when we were praying that God so loved the world that he sent his son Jesus. What does this have to do with anything? Um, words have weight, and I, and I want my words to, to preface what I'm about to say next, okay? Um, what happened on Wednesday in our country shocked me, maybe shocked some of you too. In fact, I'm, I'm a person who's not uh, tethered to the news. Some of you are, and that's okay. Uh, I'm not. I, I typically can walk, I can go days, weeks, I'll be honest with you, sometimes multiple weeks without ever seeing a news report. I know, it's awesome. <laughs> Anyways, um, someone came into my office and said, Jeff, have you been watching what's happening in D.C. right now? I had no idea. So I flip on the, um, 
internet or whatever that is, and uh, I sound, I'm my brain, seriously, I don't know what's happening. Um, but I, I go to the news sites, and I'm, I'm seeing what's happening, and I'm shocked. And you know what shocked me? I wasn't shocked that there were protester, protesters. I've been hearing of that for some time now. I wasn't shocked of any of those things. What shocked me is when I saw an image, one particular image, well, two shocked me. One, that someone had set up a gallows or a noose was hanging in D.C. somewhere. I don't know where exactly. I didn't dive into that, but that was like, <gasps> I'm like, that's a thing? I had no idea. <laughs> we do that now? But the other thing was this, is that there were many of the protesters erecting a giant cross um, in the middle of their protest. Now, I don't know where or when or who the people are. I just know this. When I saw the image of that, I went, oh, my, oh my gosh. In, in so doing, they're almost trying to say that the, the, the very actions that they're going to do next are somehow um, authorized by Jesus. And I, I love you. And I need you to hear this. I don't think they were. I don't think that is the heart of God. Two words rung out in my mind this whole week. I had a sermon already prepped to preach this week. I was well ahead of schedule. New Year's resolutions, anyone? Well ahead. And then Wednesday came, and I scrapped it. And I said, I have to do something else. And two words popped up. The first is idolatry. That there are many Christians, well, maybe some of us, who have become uh, idolaters, um, especially when it comes to our country, especially when it comes to our government especially when it comes to things of politics, that they have become our catch-all, be-all for everything. And as Christians, we think we have the right to mandate certain things in our country and our political systems and all that stuff. Um, so idolatry um, rose to the top of my, my mind. And another word that I'll have to define for you is, is syncretism. syncretism. Syncretism just means this in a Christian context, is that we have the faith in Jesus, right, of what God is doing through him, and his works, but we add to the work of Jesus other things. Now, Paul had to deal with some of this stuff in the New Testament um, from people called the Judaizers. Not even if you know who they are, that they were saying that Jesus has done a lot for us. Jesus' salvation or brings salvation and reconciliation for us. But these Judaizers were also saying that if you're going to follow Jesus, you also have to be circumcised. And you also have to follow all the Jewish food laws. And you also have to follow all the Jewish holidays. And they were adding to salvation, the work that Jesus has done, all of these other things. And, and, and I think what's happening in our culture today is that we've taken the faith in Jesus, right, and we've added things to it. Hear me, what I, hear me when I say this. There are many people who believe that if you're going to be a Christian in America, you have to be Republican. Okay, that's syncretism. That's adding to faith something that doesn't belong there. Now, can you be a Christian and be Republican? Yes, of course, absolutely. Do you have to be? Oh, God, no, I hope not. No, not that I have anything against Republicans, but the same can be true for Democrats. Hear me when I say this. You can look on both sides of the political aisle and you will find truth in them. Neither party has the whole um, truth. Neither party does everything just as God intends it to be done. Both of those parties are filled with people like you and me. They're narcissists. They have their own desires. They're trying to do their own things many times. And throwing a cross on top of it does not mean it's godly. It doesn't. In fact, I would argue it's preaching. It's proclaiming. It's saying words that aren't in fact true. In 2017, a Pew Research project went out and surveyed Americans, and they found this, that a third of Americans polled believed that to be an American, right, you had to be Christian. What does that say to all the immigrants who've come here? What does it say to all the people who don't have the same faith that we do, that somehow they're, they're less of an American because they don't have our faith in Jesus? Can I remind you, you didn't believe in Jesus either at some point, right? God in, his God, in his great grace towards you, opened your eyes that you would see. We sing the song, I once was blind, but now I see. You're not smart enough to figure this out, ladies and gentlemen. God showed it to you. And to then look at other people and say, because they don't believe like you, they're less than, is wrong. It's, it's not the heart of God. Did I give you guys my email address? I'm just making sure. <laughs> I want to make sure you have an opportunity to share things with me. Chris, I await your email. 
Chris sends me an email every week. I love it. <laughs> um, idolatry and syncretism. Idolatry. Glenn Packian, Dr. Reverend Glenn Packian, said that um, you can spot an idol when you look to something. Um, an, idol, an idol is something that you look to to, to bring peace to you, to bring salvation to you, to bring hope to you, to bring security to you, to bring all these things to you that can't, in fact, bring those things to you. Hear, hear me when I say this. Um, our political system cannot save us. It cannot. It might make our 401ks grow. Yay. Okay, and we can vote for that thing. I have no problem voting for the candidate that's going to make your 401k grow. That's fine if you want to do that. I'll also remind you some of the words of Jesus and about the, the love of money, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Okay, I'm just saying you can do those types of things. But our political system is not our savior. It's not the one that's going to save us. It's not the one that's going to bring us comfort and peace and all those things. There is one who can do that. And what's his name again? Uh, what's his name again? Jesus. Yes, the answer is Jesus. My hope is that, um, that God would love us enough to, to allow sandpaper or abrasion to rub up against us um, in our particular beliefs that would cause discomfort and cause us to look into why we feel so unsettled. For me on Wednesday, when I saw the, the, the picture of the cross and that symbol of what I believe and hold all to be true and all that, when it was merged with the picture of an American flag... Um, it hurt me inside. I have no problems with American flags. I'm so thankful to Jesus that I'm an American. Do not hear me. I'm not an anarchist. I'm not a communist. I'm, none of I'm, I'm thankful to be here. But those two things are not synonymous with one another. Do you understand? And there are times when the cross is going to ask us to do something that stands against the flag. <laughs> and our allegiance would be to the, the cross first not the other. So that's the thing that hurt me. And what happens, unfortunately, when we, when we take scripture and we le level self-importance into it, when we become narcissists, when we read scripture and we see ourselves in it, or we replace um, Israel with America, you know, you, you know, the Bible interpreters who've done some strange things with things like that. Somehow America has a place to play on the world stage. It involves, I don't mean to be dismissive of this. I just don't believe in this. Okay. So I just, we could talk about that later, but when we place certain tribes or nations above others, I think we're doing a disservice to what God's actually doing. And we can minimize the power of God's word for us. Hear me when I say this, if the, if the savior of our lives is not really Jesus, then there's no wonder we're fraught with anxiety <laughs> and depression and, and uh, strife in our lives because our Savior was, in fact, something else. But when our Savior is the real thing, when it's really Jesus, he can address anxiety and strife and turmoil in our lives. And we need God in his great care for us to reveal that to us. And maybe today is some of that. Maybe it's some of it. At best, that's what we can do. At worst, it will do this. It will cause us to exalt our nation above others and will cause us to, to, to do things that I would argue are ungodly in the name of Jesus. Ungodly in the name of Jesus. So I want to finish with this last thought. Um. You have permission, is what I wrote here, to be a Democrat or Republican. Like, you need permission from me. You don't. You don't. You have permission to think. You have permission to have political views. You have permission to do all of those things. What you don't have permission is to, is to use those thoughts or ideologies to mistreat other people. You don't have those you know, permission to, to use, to replace Jesus and what he's doing in our lives with something that's not him. Last verse is this. Uh, the Apostle John, um, many of you know he was exiled to an island at one point for his teachings about Jesus. Because remember, words matter. 
And there were people who didn't like his words, so they exiled him to an island and says, silence, you can preach all that crazy to the goats on this island. And they send him out to this island. <laughs> um, at some point, he was rescued from the island or released from the island. We don't know. And he, and he lands back into the Near East there. And he, it, history tells us he finds his way to a town called Ephesus where there's a church established there. And the Christians there would carry John around well into his advanced years. He's in his 90s possibly. Um, they would carry him around, and he would just continually tell the people to love one another. And he used language like this, little children, you should love one another, love one another, love one another, love one another. Christians, hear me, love one another. And in his letter, 1 John chapter 5, verse 21, he, he even encouraged the little children to keep yourselves from idols. The, the implication here is that, that we have to guard ourselves from idols. Hear me, just because you're a Christian does not mean you're impervious to idolatry. Okay, we have to guard ourselves. We have the truth of Jesus and everything he's doing sort of behind a stronghold, a keep, if you will, and we've been placed on a watchtower. And John is saying, little children, Guard yourself from all the things that the world out there would tell you is actually true because you're holding on to the truth. So we need to guard ourselves from what the world would tell us our beliefs should be. But we need to look to Scripture and to the story of Scripture and what Jesus truly means um, to us. Uh, I'm over time. I didn't work on a close. I didn't think I'd get this far. I thought panic would settle in and I'd run out of here at this point. <laughs> That's a real story. I thought I'm like, screw it. It'll be fine. Worship. Come on. Let's go. Um, so I didn't really have a close. But you know what feels appropriate to me right now? Oh, all right. Okay. Um, okay. There... There's a word that we use in Christian circles um, oftentimes that many people don't fully understand what it is. It's the word repent. Repent, just from a biblical understanding definition, just means to, to turn around and to return to God. To return to God. So when, when John is crying out in the desert, repent, repent, he's, he's telling people to turn around from what they're doing and return back to God. So Here's, here's the word I think that God would have for us right now, is that many of us need to repent. I'm not saying you're a bad person. And just so you know, I think the Lord's asking me to repent too. <laughs> so I'm, I'm not like, okay, y'all need to repent. I'll be down here to pray for you if you need some help. No, I think the Lord would have us to repent. And repent just means this. We're going we're gonna to ask God to reveal some of the things in our lives that we've actually used as uh, crutches is the wrong idea, but um, that we've used to bring peace to us when in fact Jesus is the one that's supposed to be peace. And no wonder we get a little nervous because that thing can't actually provide us peace. And so there's all of these things in our lives that we've leaned on for so long. And when they start to crumble before national television, right, before us on national television, we freak out. We just need to repent. He's not mad. He would warn us. He's like, you know, that's, you. okay, so... That being said, I'm going to close in prayer. The band's going to return. And in this prayer, I'm just going to ask God to lead us in repentance. I have nothing planned. And you can, you can uh, agree with these words in your heart. What, I don't care. So um, I love you. I'm a pastor. And God has placed me here to love on you and to shepherd you. And I'm doing my best. And I, I think this is what God would ask of us. So if you disagree, that's fine. Um, did I give you my email? All right. So anyways. My email, by the way, is josh at rendicator. <laughs> it's not true. Anyways, um, Father, forgive us. Uh, number one, we have made the story of um, your son Jesus and all the work that you're doing about us. We admit we've become narcissists and self-important people. And um, we oftentimes miss the fact that you love everyone as much as me. And so, God, I don't carry that love for others sometimes. I don't carry that love for people who don't vote like me, who don't dress like me and think like me. But God, so we, 
we repent from that idea. God, we repent from the idea that, um, that our nation is somehow more special than any of the other nations. History is a quick teacher to remind us that all nations come and go. And that America, should the, the world continue to go on and on and on, that it's quite possible we'll read of America in the history books as well. But Lord, you, you remain. You remain forever. So we repent, Lord, that we've actually put more emphasis in our nationalism than into our Christianity, into our faith, Lord. So we just ask, God, that you help us to move back, that we'd move back to where you are. God, we thank you for the weight of the words that you have, the weight of the words that John spoke in Revelation, that all the nations had come, and that we are included in that, Lord. And we're included because of your great grace towards us. Undeserved favor. We're invited in, God, because of your great love for us, not of anything that we have done. So, God, I thank you for all of that. God, would you allow us now to, to rest in your strength, to rest in your ability? Um, make no mistake, God, we know there are real spiritual forces at work in the world. We know that. And we get an opportunity to engage them oftentimes. But ultimately, God, it is you who will overcome them all. And so, God, we thank you for that. We love you, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. We're, we're way over on time. I'm going to allow the band to play this song. But just know this. If you have children downstairs, um, my children's workers will uh, murder me if you don't go get them immediately after we're done here, okay? Because it's 10 o'clock right now, so we'll do this song. <laughs> and I need you to go pick up your children, okay? You promise me? <laughs> right, as soon as we're done. So anyways, uh, God bless all of you. Would you please stand as we worship?
Heavenly Father, God, we surrender to you, dear Heavenly Father, Jesus. We praise you, God, for fighting our battles, dear Heavenly Father, God. We worship you today. We sing your praises, Jesus. Hallelujah. that only you can give. God, we thank you that you surround us with your peace. God, you cover us with your love. God, if we will just ask you're there, you're there, you're there. So God, we ask you that you would, you would meet us right where we are. You would cover our hearts with your love and with your peace. God, you would help us to share your gospel, the truth of your word that brings life, that brings hope, that brings healing, that brings so much peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, if you are, if you are one who is looking for prayer, somebody to pray with you, we're going to have a couple people that will be up here, and we'll stay as long as we need to make sure we meet every need. But for the rest of you, let me say a quick blessing over you. May the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen. You are loved and you are dismissed.